You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Hello, I'm Miranda Holmes. I'm one of the artistic directors of Gabriella Players, and I have also directed five of the last seven Gabriella Players pantos. In case you haven't actually ever seen a panto, and I don't know why you haven't, it is a very popular British form of theatre that's associated with the Christmas season. It's generally based on some sort of fairy tale or fable, but occasionally you, know, you throw in Will Shakespeare. It's a form of madness, I suppose. Um, just a delightful family entertainment with lots of singing, lots of bad jokes, villains to boo and heroes to cheer, and a lot of audience interaction. It's just a lot of fun. Today you're going to be watching a show about the history and tradition of Pantos on Gabriola, which started in 2007. First up, you're going to hear from BJ Godson, who has the honor of being the only person who has appeared in every single panto we've done since 2007. After that, I'm going to be chatting with Jen Feenan, who brought the panto to Gabriola in 2007 with a production of Cinderella, and has herself directed four of the pantos that we've done. After that, you'll get to hear from one of our greatest villains, Joe DeCara, a man who didn't know it until 2014, but was born to play a pantomime villain. And finally, I'll be chatting with Tom Radcliffe, who has appeared in the last couple of pantos, and I'll just be chatting a bit more personally about the panto and me. Hope you enjoy the show. Well, I started as a kid, grade one. I was out there doing The Shoemaker and His Wife and all through school. And then when I taught school, a lot of my teaching things would be involving, perhaps the, they weren't always in the curriculum, but my class was always doing something musical or silly or making a song or making up little plays and skits and stuff like that. And then uh, when I started hanging out in Gabriola before I actually moved here, uh, different f people said, I think you'd be a good candidate. We're, we're thinking about starting this Gabriel Players thing, and I went, okay, let's try that. And then it just seemed like a shoe in I just loved it. The Pantos didn't start till 2007, but we had things going on before Jen Feenan arrived and introduced us to the British Panto. That tradition goes back about 250 years, and very much there is always a hero, there's always a hero heroine who gets lost or is locked up in a dungeon or something, and the hero ends up saving her. Hero always has two henchmen, um, and they are often the ones who get the booze, plus the villain, there's always a villain. And the inter audience interaction is very much the booing, the hissing, of course the clapping, laughing along. They don't need to be told to do applause, like you see some signs up, they just automatically know. And um, there's always some kind of a song, and lately we've really put a lot of musicality into the pantos. So not only are you doing all the rehearsals for that, you're learning your songs and your dances and everything else. And in the pantos, there's always, behind you, behind you, at least once. And then the interaction that the audience loves most is, she didn't say that, did she? Yes, she did. Oh, no, she didn't. Oh, yes, she did. And this goes back and forth, depending. You don't want it to be ad nauseum, but at least three times. And the audience loves that. Because it's so silly up there. And sometimes you just can't stop laughing, even when you're doing your own part. The directors usually let you get away with, this is the essence of what that sentence should have said. So you didn't say every word properly, but what the heck. We've got, we understand what you mean. And as long as you didn't interfere with the person that's coming after you and they have their cue line, then, then you're good to go. And because um, we get permission from, for instance, Robin Bales, who's been the writer of our last five pantos, 
he is given permission to take out anything that's British, because he lives in England, and so we put in Nanaimo references and Gabriel and Cedar and so on and make it so much more local. And that's what the people love when you're bashing something about Cats Alive or Gabriel Garden Homes or something like that. It's just so easy for people to um, connect with what you're saying. It gives them the better belly laugh too. So I loved being Twinkie the Elf in The Christmas Caper and uh, Little Miss Muffet in The Pirates of Nursery Rhyme Island which was a silly, fun role, and I got to throw pablum, which was supposed to be curds and whey. <laughs> but the, it was the costume in that one. It was the best costume in the entire planet. And it was so fun. When we did uh, The Wizard of Oz, I was still living on Mudge. So instead of, I was king of the Munchkins, but Jen let me say king of the Mudgekins. So <laughs> I got a big kick out of that one. <laughs> About 65 people are needed, 50 to 60 people, 65, a couple of things I read. So when you, when you open your program, you'll see the list of the actors. And then when you get to the crew, it's like two pages long. And it's nice, I think, even though the, the people that are sponsoring it have to pay some money. Uh, that's how we pay our bills, of course. But it lets them be part of it as well. And for instance, when Robert's Restaurant was here, he sponsored... He was our season sponsor that Tina and Guy now are in the real estate. And they get the whole back page of the program and special commendation or whatever. But it involves so many people. And the kids love it, especially the pantos, because they're always in the front row and they get to do the booing and hissing or if there's something to throw, they can throw that. Or it's, I don't know, it's just very inclusive. And the audience loves it. We have a loyal following that'll go, it doesn't matter what the panto is, they're going to go anyway. But we seem to have upped the level, upped the ante, upped the everything on them. And there's some of us who have been in, not only myself, I'm the only one who's been in all of them, but there are other people like Joe Ducera, who he was born to be the villain in a panto. So I've probably been in four, at least with him. And Nancy Jenner, who's sadly gone to heaven, but I was in four pantos with her, and we were like always the, the team. So in Rumpelstiltskin, we were snatch and grab. That sort of camaraderie went along. I don't know, it's just a fun, wonderful thing, and I'm really glad that Jen Feenan brought that to Gabriola in 2007. Hi, I'm Miranda Holmes. I am one of the artistic directors of Gabriel the Players, and I am also one of Gab the two Gabriel Players panto queens, which means I have directed multiple pantos, five of the last seven, I believe. And I am here with Jen Feenan, who originally brought pantos to Gabriola, and is the other panto queen. Jen, can you tell me, had anyone at Gabriella Players ever heard of a panto when you first suggested it in 2007? They thought it was a mime and they wouldn't learn any words. So I really <laughs> started flat. Um, and nobody seemed that keen at the beginning. But once they realized, uh, yes, indeed, they would have lines to learn at. And it was just a play, but a different style. Um, it was good. I got... Cinderella was the first thing I did, and I am not good with music, so we didn't have any singing in it. Um, but the reaction to that play afterwards was incredible. So many people came, it was the seats were full every night, and uh, everybody wanted to be involved, and that was the whole point. We wanted to involve as many people in the community as we could. And people came out of the woodwork, people who wanted to do costumes and people who'd like to do the set and people for music. It was wonderful, wonderful. Well, that is the thing that's great about the Pantos is you can get so many people involved in so many different ways. So Cinderella was the first. What were the other ones you did? I think at some point um, somebody did Drumple Stil Stiltskin. I sort of was uh, co-directing, but not much because I had to leave um, the country for a while. And then I did uh, The Yellow Brick Road. Oh, Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. 
And that to me was my piece de resistance. I wrote some of the songs in it and uh, I took the comments we'd had seriously. So there was a lot of singing and a lot of different characters. The costumes were incredible. And I felt that it was a really good pantomime. And as evidenced by the, the attendance, it was great. You actually tried to find out about using songs from the film, didn't you? And they were going to charge some phenomenal amounts, which is that how you great. ended up writing the songs? Yeah, so they, I wrote to Disney um, to ask if I could use the Yellow Brick Road song. And uh, I got a lawsuit letter back. And in fact, cease and desist. You can't do this. Oh, and my goodness. I thought, well, yes, I can. So I wrote back and said, you're too late in any case. Don't bother sending the music. You're too late. I've already written new songs. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I didn't. But they thought we were using their version. They didn't realize we were using a, we were playing a pantomime. And they, they um, obviously didn't read the fine print. Mm. So of all the pantos you've directed, was it of ours would be your favorite? Wizard of Oz surprised me. I didn't realize that I was capable of it, and yet I did. And and then the next one was um, Scrooge, and it was as much as of an extravaganza as well. We had mm -hmm. black eyes on. In fact, <laughs> we had black eyes, and the person who was doing the curtains got mixed up and closed the curtains during that scene when she wasn't supposed to, or just on one performance, and then the fire alarm went off. So everybody had to go outside, and then we all had to come back in again and start over. Oh. But yeah, it was it was a really good one too. And then the Rat King came after that. Yes, which was my first yes, attempt. Which was, and I was saying to Tom the other day, I was cast in the smallest role as Rap 2, didn't even merit a name. And it gives me the fact that there was a Rap 1 that was a bigger role than Rap 2. But yeah, I, it, I enjoyed it so much. I think if you're British, as a kid, pantos were just so much of the holiday season, weren't they? Yeah, it's in your blood, I think. If, you, if you're British, you know all about it. And the really nice thing about it is that one of the Gabriels who was in a few of the pantos uh, moved to Galliano and she started them up there and they're doing pantos all the time too. So that's really good. Do you remember what the first panto was you saw as a kid? God, no, I can't. I remember there was buttons in it and Mother Goose. That was about... <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, that's... I love the fact that I love how much the kids enjoy pantos and, you know, the fact that they can yell and well, sometimes inappropriately, but, you know. <laughs> but they're almost part of the part of the whole thing. And you have to be able to respond to them and you can't allow yourself to be put off by them. So, yeah. you know, you they're part of it. Actually, one of They get bigger laughs than we do sometimes. <laughs> yes, they do. I actually remember the first time um, I t my partner, Mike, and I came. I think, yeah, it was Rumpelstiltskin in 2008. He had never been to a panto before in his life. And we were sitting there, and right from the get-go, I was all, behind you, and, oh, no, you don't. And he's just looking. <laughs> and then he realized everybody else was, and he kind of got into it. But... So, since then, you have appeared in a number of pantos. Since you took over my role <laughs> as director of pantos, I, have, I've been, I think I've been in every one in a small role. Well, you had the rather substantial role of Queen Elizabeth in Will Shakespeare. I did, I did. Yeah, so it was fun to be on the other end of the, the stage than, than directing different responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Now there's a, just the lines to learn. You were fantastic as Queen Elizabeth. Oh <laughs> Thank my God. You. <laughs> when I read that script, I was just like, oh, I have to have ten for Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> so I'm so glad you agreed. Yeah, that was a lot of work. I must have sung that song to myself more than a million times in the living room here with the pretend mic. And I still made mistakes. <laughs> 
it's funny you said that because we're we're sort of bookmarked at the moment with Cinderella because you started it with Cinderella in 2007 and then I did the Robin Bales version last year and you're saying that you know you're not good with music so you didn't have any songs in it I'm not good with music either but I was just like well there will be music somehow magically there will be music well, one of the nice things about when we did the first Cinderella is that people came out to do sound. You know, the mm -hmm. people who had skills mm -hmm. and could do sound for me, because I didn't, I didn't know anything really. I can't read music. I can sing, but I can't read music. And I just didn't think that someone like me could do music. But in mm -hmm. fact, you can, as long as you've got a good lot of people behind you. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, Steve Elder, bless him. Yes, yes, he was marvelous in making sure we have music for things. Uh, yes. It's one thing I did learn with uh, Will Shakespeare, the Panto, the, because we didn't really do, re do a lot of rehearsals with the musical numbers in them, and we didn't do any that were music only. And that was something I realized afterwards, and we should have had some of the rehearsals devoted just to the songs. And I have done that since. Yeah, well, you learn as you go. Yes, indeed. I remember Steve Elder saved our bacon and one, we were, I forget which show it was, but um, in, in the middle of the performance, there was a bang and I saw a lot of activity around the sound table and all of a sudden there was no music. We just kept going and they sang everything a cappella and he ran home because that's where he had the duplicate um, <laughs> disc and ran back again and put it in. And by the second half, we had the music back. And later when we talked to the audience, most of them hadn't noticed that there was no music. <laughs> so, there were, wasn't there one panto where something blew, a car blew yeah. up in the parking lot or something? Yeah, it started, it, it started a uh, fire, it caught fire somehow and uh, was threatening the cars on the side of it. And of course, as soon as it was mentioned, they had to call it in the audience, your car is on fire. It's on fire. Everyone had to go out and look. So we had to put the panto on hold while we were to make sure their car was safe. Mm -hmm. And then when they all piled back into the room, we, we started again. <laughs> if you had a favorite moment from any panto, either directing or appearing in, what would it be? I don't know. There's too many, too many to choose. And just, just being involved in pantos to me is a joy. Whatever part of you're playing in it, whether you're directing it or acting in it. And I've done props for pantos and I've done uh, a set design for pantos, not on Gabriola, but before. Yes, that. have you did the Aladdin's cake? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got into set design. Any, any part of it is a joy to me. It's all like magic and I love that. Mm -hmm. I like to think of there being magic in the world. And we are so blessed on this island with I mean, talented and creative people. Although I have to say, we're having a really hard time recruiting makeup artists. So if you're a makeup artist, if I'm Gabriel and you'd like to get involved, please get in touch with us. Yeah, we, we have we have had some wonderful makeup artists in the past. Mm -hmm. They just never seem to stay here. Yeah. I don't know what the problem is. Said, Why would you move off Gabriel? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Honestly. Now it's, that's one of the things about you know, when you're directing a panto, it's, it's not like directing anything else. You know, with most plays, quite probably there's one set and there are actors who come in and go off and say things and things happen and then the play's over. And the rehearsal process is fairly straightforward and there may not even be any sound in it. Or is with a panto, there's just so many different elements. You know, as he say, the sets, the costumes, um, um, yeah, the music. A, a director I ran, ran into once said that pantos, it was like herding cats <laughs> to try and get a panto up on, on its legs. And in a way it is. But the joy of it is that you have a lot of freedom in a panto you can it doesn't have to be exactly as written with re, as it is with mm. a regular play you, you're allowed to embellish and add things and and uh, you can draw on 
uh, things that your actors give you and their talents. And I think it's got a lot of things in it that just make it more fun than um, than a serious play. Not that they're not worth, worth yeah. watching, but it's just life. It just lives the whole time. Oh, no, I, that's one of the things I, I love is what actors will bring to it. I mean, just as one example, when Ray decided... His legs. Yeah, he was going to do his Elvis legs for that song. You know, before he was even in the costume, before we had the sets behind us, every time he did it at a rehearsal, I just... I, like, sometimes I had to cover my eyes because it was I can't even look at this. It's so funny, it's hurting me. <laughs> but that was all him. Yeah. yeah, it had nothing to do with me, and that's that's happened with other people. They, you know, they bring things, and you're just like, oh, that's great, let's do that. Eat that. Yes, eat that. that. So what, what about you? What's your favourite, with the one you feel most about? Um, you know, I think it probably is Will Shakespeare and the Panto in many ways, A, because it was the first, and B, because the script was just so good. But then I also, I have just favorite moments from some of them. One of them is Ray's <laughs> song. Um, a new one from last year when, you know, Prince Charming and Cinderella were doing their dance. And I was sitting at the back thinking, oh my God, that's the most romantic thing I think has ever been in a panto and Gabriola. <laughs> oh my God, look at it. Yeah, it was. And, and in um, Robin Hood, the Act One finale, Don't Stop Me Now. Oh, yes. Yeah. I love it. You know, <laughs> Alexander did such a great job with the choreography, and I just remember sitting in, again, the back row on opening night looking at it. I was like, I just can't believe how beautiful this is, how wonderful this is. Doris collapsing, you know, and it's like, it's okay, Cease will be behind you, and, you know. <laughs> And he was, and Paul's air guitar, it's, yeah. So I, I, it's hard to pick a favorite. Just there are moments from all of them that I just can't believe worked as well yes. as they did. I know that. I mean, you just love them, don't you? Mm. You love the characters, and you love their end product and the audience reaction. It's just, just all good. Yes. Well, thanks, Jen. <laughs> We are the Panto Queen. Yes, we are. Mark and Sassy and only 70. <laughs> we know the 70. <laughs> no. Thanks, Jen. It's been great talking to you. You're welcome. <laughs> Good talking to you, too. Happy uh, Panto Land. Yes, and let's hope we're back at it next year. Yes, let's hope you're back at it next oh, year. <laughs> No, honestly, thank you. For, and thank you so much for, you know, you were an inspiration to me when I was doing the Pied Piper, you know. I, was, I learned a lot just watching what you were doing, so thank you for that. Oh, thank you. You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television, for you, by you. Oh, well, the, the villain is such a, a wonderful role to always get to play. Uh, you get to be the bad guy, and you, I, I've always said you always get the best lines because <laughs> you get to be mean. You don't have to be a nice person. You get to let that side out, and uh, it's just a tremendous amount of fun. The costuming is wonderful because unlike a lot of the dramas we do, it's often dealing with people in their everyday, ordinary dress, but the costumes are just in those pantos because of the setting and everything else is just fabulous. So that really, it just adds to the overall sense of, uh, of theater. I remember in, uh, in Will Shakespeare panto when it was a few weeks before opening and the costumes finally showed up at rehearsals and I just was astounded at how it changed. Be uh, Ginny was and Sam were the two henchmen, and once they put on their costumes, it was it just it it heightened the sense of the character being the characters.
I'm TJ Radcliffe, and this is Life on Gabriola TV. Today, I am interviewing Miranda Holmes uh, of the Gabriola Players, uh, particularly in her role as a director of the Gabriola Christmas Pantos for many years past. Five of the last seven. <laughs> I'd like to start by just talking a little bit about uh, your history with the players. Well, it actually did begin with a panto in 2011. Um, earlier in the year, in March, my partner Mike died suddenly of a massive heart attack. And that September, I was going through the sound at home and I saw a small ad for auditions for the panto. My first reaction was, oh, the panto. Mike and I used to love going to the pantos in which I could face going on my own. So I started to turn the page, and then I suddenly thought, wait a minute, I used to love doing theatre when I was in school. Maybe I should go to those auditions and get, I don't know, a small role or something backstage, and just get involved in something that gets me out of the house and out of my head. So I went. It was Pied Piper that year, which Jen Feenan was directed. I was cast in the smallest role. I was Rat 2. I didn't even merit a name, and the fact that I was Rat 2 tells you that there was a Rat 1 who had more lines than me. <laughs> but, yeah, it was huge fun, and of course, pantos are something that, you know, I won't say were like mother's milk to me, but certainly I have, it was something my mum and I used to do every Christmas, and, yeah, so you I'm very fond up of with pantos. I did, yeah. I did, so, yeah, and had, I had no idea in 2011, when I was on stage delivering my five lines of no more than 20 words, that three years later I would be directing a panto myself, but and that's how, how it turned out. <laughs> how did that transition occur? How did you go from rat number two to in charge of the whole enterprise? Oh. In early August 2014, Gene Weinberg and I were out there on the deck on the surf. Minding, I was minding my own business, having a glass of wine, and she suddenly said to me, you do realize you're going to have to direct the panto this year. And I did a whole Robert De Niro, you talking to me thing, and realized, oh, dang. Yeah, there really isn't anyone else. So after the glass of wine, I went home and started trolling through the many UK websites that feature nothing but panto scripts. And I thought, I, at that point, the only thing I had directed was um, Inherit the Wind. It's a very a big piece, but very serious, very... And I just thought, oh, God, if I'm going to direct a panto, it can't just be Puss in Bloody Boots. I need something a bit more interesting. And after about three goes, I ended up on this website that had them all listed alphabetically. It was, you know, Aladdin, Alibaba, Beauty and the Beast, Cinderella, yada, yada. And I'm reading down, and then right near the bottom, I see Will Shakespeare, the panto. It's like, oh, hello. <laughs> that sounds interesting. So I ordered a copy of the script, which I absolutely loved. And even though I had some slight trepidation about mounting a panto called Will Shakespeare on Gabriel, where people were used to fairy tales, I just thought, oh, it's a great script. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, this yeah. is the one for me. So that was the first one. Yeah. And that was uh, a Robin Bales. Secret. Yes, that was by Robin Bales. Interesting, I did not realize that if Gene and I had been having that conversation out on the deck in early July, that script would not have been there because it was published in July 2014. So in fact, we staged the world premiere of Will Shakespeare, the Panto. And yeah, I fell in love with the guy's writing. Um, yeah. It's like by April, May the next year, I kept waiting for someone to say, oh, I guess it's my turn to direct the panto. And nobody was saying it. So I thought, okay, let's see what else this guy Bales has written. And there were, there were four other scripts, two of which were Robin Hood, Robin Hood and then the return of Robin Hood. 
I read both, and I actually like the second script more than the first. But I thought, well, you can't do that without doing the first one. So I went to the board of Gabriel Plays and said, okay, you are in luck. Not only am I willing to do the Panto again this year, but I am already, I will commit to doing it next year. We'll do these two back to back. And then I will be done. <laughs> so I got tears off and before I was back again. Panto's <laughs> uh, are big productions. God, yes. What, what are the challenges of producing something with with a cast of tens and and backstage of dozens yeah it, in a small community um it it's huge and normally if you're directing a play and you hold auditions you cast it you have your rehearsals and eventually you know you get to the point where you're starting to rehearse with the stage and you need a crew but with a panto it's everything. It's set design, set painting, costumes, makeup, um, set construction, trying to figure out how to mount a panto at the community hall, which is not a theater. You know, best will in the world, that place is not a theater. Its actual stage is tiny. And, you know, so we have the risers up there. The cast is huge. I mean, that was one good thing about doing Inherit the Wind. That had 20 people wow. in it. <laughs> so that part I had actually already got over. But, yeah, there's usually between 12 and 15 people, which is a lot to get in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, usually half a dozen large roles, but there's always a lot of smaller roles. Well, I mean, last year you picked up you played one of the tiny roles as well as your main role which yeah. you know, it was great that people can do that and you know of course it's the there are the musical numbers and you know yeah. hoping against hope that you will find people who can sing and you have found that and well it was funny last year i when i decided to do cinderella i originally thought i would have two different people playing Cinderella and Prince Charming. And the person I thought would be playing Prince Charming, you know, lovely, lovely person, but best will in the world, cannot sing. So one of the first things I took out of the script was Prince Charming's song. It's like, well, we're not doing that. And then of course we cast Ben, who can sing. And I was like, okay, well, let's go back and see how many songs I can give this guy. There are challenges as well, because we're an older community. Yes. That is it tough finding people who are not gray haired and well this is actually one of the main reasons we're not doing a panto this year is um you know we have a lot of backstage stalwarts the stage managers props other people who are either approaching or have passed the 70 mark and just flat out said after the last one it's like i can't do it it's too exhausting so this year we have been in the process of trying to recruit and and train some people up and you cannot throw somebody new into a panto you will never see them again <laughs> if they actually make it to the end you will never see them again <laughs> which is what happened with alibaba but never mind um so yeah i mean there's so many different elements and yes. it's so satisfying though you know, you sit in the back row on opening night and watch it all come together on the stage and just grin from ear to ear. You know, it's, it's, there's magic. Yeah, there is. And the kids love it as well. But... Oh, that's well, to me, a great panto script is one that has all sorts of things that kids will love, especially the villain, but also has things in it that would go right over kids' heads that adults will love. And that's one of the things I loved about the Bale scripts. Yeah. And as they had that. We do. Traditionally, Pantos have leaned heavily on stereotypes that might not be uh, entirely collegial to modern audiences. Has that been a challenge at all? Um, well, it depends on what you're talking about. I mean, certainly, you know, 50 years ago, it would not be uncommon and panto that was put on in the UK to have, um, you know, 
a an Arab character who is just corrupt and horrible and you know, ugh, or a Chinese character or a black character that was very stereotyped. You don't see that so much these days. And quite honestly, if I did see that in a script, that would be the end of the script. But, you know, it's not something you come across. What I think is more of a challenge um, for someone like me who grew up with pantos, and there are certain elements I love, one of which is there is always, well, generally the, the dame, the very flamboyant female character in a panto is played by a man. We've only managed to do that twice, um, once in, I think, 2008, yeah, and 10 years later, in 2018. Um, so, you know, the, that particular role was always played by a, a woman in our pantos, but in a British panto, it's, you know, it wouldn't be a panto if the dame wasn't oh, being played know that. by a man. Oh, yes, in, back in the 2000s when Kevin Spacey took over the old Vic in London and which is where I used to go to see pantos with my mum when I was a kid, but they hadn't done pantos for years, and he decided to bring back the tradition, and he put on Aladdin with Ian McKellen as a will widow twanky. Oh, that would be fabulous. It was fantastic. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's this is something that, you know, you have to be aware, has to be done... If it's done at all, it has to be done right, because these are issues that are, are you know, more and more people feel very strongly about representation, yeah. about gender representation. So, you know, it is something that we have to be aware of. But do you think it can be done respectfully? I think so. I think so. Um, but... You know, you can't please everyone Good. all the time. So even, you know, I think it. I think generally we do a good job with that. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, for example, last year with Cinderella, the stepsisters, as is traditionally the case, were played by men. Yeah. And I thought John and Neil did an absolutely fabulous job. Yeah. And I think the vast majority of people who saw it thoroughly enjoyed their performances. But there were people who were unhappy about it. Or oh, were there? So, yeah. Yeah. You no, know, it's a yeah. tough call. Yeah. And they were playing you know, a character type. A character, sure, really. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, rather, than, rather than a particular gender, they were playing a, a particular yeah. type of nasty person. Yes. Of yes. Gender. Where do you see Panto and Gabriel going in the future? Well, I hope it's a tradition that continues. I think it's, over the years, it has very much become, yeah, a tradition. On Gabriel, it's kind of like, oh, it's the panto. It must be the start of the kick kickoff for the holiday season. So, I mean, people love it. I mean, you know, people, it's genuinely, we get good crowds. Everybody loves it. Um, you know, last year they even came out when there was a, on the Sunday when there was a power failure and they had no idea if there would be sound or light. I had forgotten which we did that. manage to run with a generator, yeah. but the place was absolutely packed. Um, yeah, I, people love it. I think, you know, you mentioned earlier, and I don't think I properly addressed it, a large, the vast majority of our members, including cast and crew, are not in the first flush of youth, <laughs> shall we say. <laughs> and that is always a challenge, both on and off stage. Um, you know, obviously, well, with a panto specifically, you know, you have a hero and a heroine, and it's good if neither of them needs a walker. <laughs> And there's also physical elements of the performance that could be challenging. And yes, and there are physical elements. And this is one of the things we do find a challenge because you know, all, all younger people tend to have jobs and find it hard to commit to the rehearsal schedule and the performance week. So, you know, it's something we struggle with and will continue to try 
yeah. to find a fix for. But if anybody out there is under 30 and would like to get involved, please let us know. Under 50? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Fair's fair. Yeah. <laughs> So, I, I mean, I, the, we don't, we're not putting on a panel this year. No, unfortunately. But yeah. is there a glimmer in your eye for next year? Oh, I very much hope we'll be back next year. I very much hope so, because, man, people love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah, so they're, and they're fantastic experiences to be yeah. part of. Yes. It's really, it, it's quite magical. It it really is. And it's, it's also magical to watch, you know. It's, I am blown away by, well, Dar Yule in particular, who does a lot of our costumes, but the people who work on our costumes, they come up with things like, last year, two of the costumes got a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, and they are. They are beautiful, and we, and the sets were beautiful last year yes. as well. Yes. There's a tremendous Thank amount Thank you, Dave, for those sets. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's it. And that's, you know, it's not always easy to find people to do the sets. Yeah. I don't know. In fact, you know, thank you, Ben, for introducing me to Dave, because, you know, when we started doing, we, when we were into rehearsal, and I still didn't have anyone to paint the sets, and he was tearing my hair out. Oh, my. And then Ben said, I have a friend who might be interested. I was like, yes, could you introduce me? Yeah. And he did. He did just a fabulous job on them. Miranda Holmes, thank you for joining us. This is Gabriel Alive TV. I'm TJ Radcliffe. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Tom.